<laughs> okay, here we go. Chapter 8, um, Lecture Module 8, um, of course, Linux Lab 8. Um, I've changed what I was, uh, I'm doing today. I'm going to cover the textbook first. At first, I wasn't. Uh, we didn't know what was going to happen with the storm tomorrow. So apparently, it's going to be a later event. So we, we should have class tomorrow. I know that's a disappointment, but <laughs> there we go. Um, so I'm inverting it. So I'm going to cover the textbook stuff to, today, and then the kind of my advanced content tomorrow, which actually gets we, we start seeing some really cool things now. Um, and I'll introduce some of it today just to kind of give a, um, a foreshadowing of what we're going to do tomorrow. OK. So here we can really start applying and understand, under, applying our foundation and understanding what's going on. The internet. Largest, most well-known computer network. We know that. OK. Where did it come from? Well, it came from the Department, um, one of the Department of Defense Advanced Research Projects, DARPA. Why? DARPA wanted a fault-tolerant network. Fault-tolerant that could survive so we could still communicate in the event of an attack. Okay. So, recall from networking, I have those four components, because we're going to look at all of them today. Fault tolerance, quality of service, security, scalability. How do I achieve fault tolerance? Let me remember. What's the easiest way? Repetition redundancy. Okay. So, now, from our network topologies, where did we have redundancy? Recall we had our bus network, a star, a ring, a mesh. A mesh. A mesh. And what is the internet? It's a partial mesh, right? Dynamic routing. So should an intermediary device go down? Should a link go down? We just route around. So we have our fault-tolerant network. We've achieved that. Okay. Uh, and the book doesn't really go into that. Uh, it is kind of interesting if you look at the development of the internet. And again, what is the internet? Well, the internet, I gave the example that it is our, you know, the example analogy of our road system. Okay? It's the physical infrastructure of the roads themselves, okay, and devices, red lights, things like that. But it's also protocols. So when we look at the inter internet, it's the infrastructure, okay, the backbones, things like that, but it's also the protocols that run on it. And we know about HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol that the World Wide Web uses. We know about file transfer protocol. SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol. So I have all these protocols running on the internet. And I can give a similar analogy with our road system. If you think about it, how can I get a letter to Florida? Well, I could drive to the post office, okay? And there's a certain protocol to that, mailing the letter. I could go to UPS, slightly different protocol. Of course, I could drive the letter to Florida myself, different protocol, okay? But you see, you see where I'm going. So the internet, we have this infrastructure, and then we have protocols running on top of it that actually govern various types of communication or transmission. Okay, the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is a service, okay? Service that's accessed, it, accessed or supported by the hypertext transfer protocol. So what is it? It's just information that can be located or retrieved from web servers. Okay. Um, you know, proposed by Tim Berners-Lee. Well, it was actually conceived earlier than that. Several authors wrote about a kind of distributed information system, and that essentially is what the World Wide Web is. When we look at Web 2.0, there's a bit below the surface that we really need to understand. The textbook doesn't go into it. Well, the Web 2.0, what is it? The conversational web, okay? Two-way communication. And this was really a big advance. You look at, say, the dot-com crash. You know, the, the Internet came out, the World Wide Web, and all these companies said, great, another means to broadcast, right? Here's all my stuff. And then the dot-com crash, because nobody wanted that. What did they want? They wanted communication, two-way participation. Well, what actually supports that? That is that three-tier architecture. If you think about it, without that, we have no Facebook, we have no e-commerce, all of these things. What is the three-tier architecture again? And I, I present it from the LAMP stack. So it is a database core, okay? the some middle layer of business logic. In our case, we'll use PHP or Java. And then an Apache web server. 
And for us, our database core, so for our LAMP stack, it's the MySQL. The so MySQL, of course, is the, is the M, Apache Web Server A, and the, um, what is that, uh, the PHP for the, um, for the uh, middle tier business logic. Talk with my hand for forgetting where I am here. Uh, so that is the core. That is what makes Web 2.0 work. So when you think about this, Amazon.com, making a purchase, right? You presented it with a web form. You put your item details in, all these things, credit card. That goes back to the Apache web server. The PHP, the middle logic, extracts the text fields, and it's those text fields that go into the database. Okay? This is my Facebook. Okay? You go log into Facebook. Facebook knows who you are because you logged in, you authenticated, and they provide you with authorized access to resources. They see what they're going to put up on your wall because these are all database components. It's constructed dynamically in real time. I change something. You know, I post something. What actually happens is that form goes back to Facebook, it's the server, goes down to that middle layer of business logic, retrieves whatever it is you wrote, and adds it to the database. Okay? Three-tier architecture. And this is what supports conversation, communication, e-commerce, web 2.0, conversational web. Now, you, some people are aware, we're starting to hear Web 3.0. Okay? What is the Web 3.0? Well, it's the semantic web. And I'm actually going to defer discussion of that until tomorrow, because the textbook doesn't present it. It's, it's in my notes. So we'll look at that on cs100.com tomorrow. <clears throat> OK, Internet 2. Internet 2 is a, started as, and still is, a research um, model, so to speak. It's fiber optic, very fast. It is secure in nature. The internet, presently, the internet one, so to speak, is not secure. To get security on our present internet, you have to do it through other additional protocols. HTTPS, okay? secure HTTP, SSL, okay? all VPNs, things like this. Tunneling protocols, which are the VPNs. So to get security on the first internet, it has to be done through protocols. It is built into the Internet, too. And that's very attractive. Okay. I'm not going to say much about the Internet community today. We're going to talk about it. We'll come back and we'll touch upon all of these things in the course of our discussion here in just a minute. We know about users. We know about you know Internet service providers, um, content providers, um, well, anyone who puts information out there. Um, Hudson Valley's website, Wikipedia, okay, all these things. Anyone who has a website is, is providing content. Application service prov providers and web services. Okay. Application service providers. Software as a service. Google Docs. Okay. Um, YouTube. Things, things of this nature. Web services. Web services provide information to web pages or just even provide information that can be used by content providers. You think about um, investing. Every investment firm out there has an app. What are they doing in real time? They're getting the New York State, uh, New York State, the um, stock exchange, New York Stock Exchange information. Okay, and they're taking this web service, getting, taking this information, formatting it. And putting it and putting it out in their app. So of course you know you're, you're on your iPad, you see the latest stock prices. Okay? So New York Stock Exchange web service, weather data coming from you know the Weather Channel or National Oceanographic Institute. Um, all these things, they're actually providing information. And what does this require? We're going to look at this again, but you have to be able to find the information, and it has to be in a standard structured format. Remember, standards provide interoperability. So this is done through XML, the extensible markup language. And we'll look at this when we get to web design. But you have to be able to find it, too. So you need somewhere a repository of what web services are available. So if you're going to you know, become a web service yourself and provide information, what do you have to do? You have to register yourself with these repositories. And then if you're going to use the information, you need some kind of web discovery tool. WDSL, um, to find the information. And then, of course, the information has to be in a structured way, right, so that you can use it. It has to be defined in that standard way. 
recall what I said about standards. I gave the example of that three-prong electrical outlet. You know, you go, it's a standard. I go to Target, I buy a toaster, I come home, I know it has a, a two or three-prong plug that's going to fit that. Standard. Same thing with information. By information is in a predetermined, structured way, it can be used universally, universally. So interoperability. Okay, so that is the web service. You'll see, and we won't get to that in this, you know, CS100 yet, but you'll see the simple object access protocol, okay, which is that structured way, SOAP. Okay, um, you'll also see these as um, service-oriented architectures, SOA. You just if you see one of these acronyms, just so you've seen it before, and this is where you're going, um, especially from the web design curriculum. Infrastructure companies, they own the structure of the internet. We're gonna, I'm going to come back to this when we talk about throttling or filtering. Um, and of course, hardware software companies. Um, I'll introduce this early, too, just because we're on, a, on that topic. Government, government also can impact, limit, information access, okay? So they can censor, coming in a slide. Um, some countries do it all the time, say China, censors, what can their, their um, citizens can see. In other cases, countries have shut down the internet right, to thwart or suppress a revolution. Um, have you ever thought, what does or what does what, what do military operations require? What's central communication? communication. Okay. And I'll introduce this when we get to electronic warfare. We we talk about electric electronic warfare, and that you know the the general person in this country is oh they'll shut down our grid, all these things. There are far worse things. Okay, think about this. If you can disrupt communications entirely. Think about this from deploying a squad of Marines. Am I going to put a squad of Marines out into a hostile area if they have absolutely no communications? They can't call for retrieval. They can't call for artillery or anything. Okay, they're they're dead. Okay, and the day is coming when organized crime can do this. Think about that. You want to pull a you know like just a simple example, a bank job, you know. If you can disrupt police communications, disrupt cellular communications, your chances uh, for success are greatly enhanced. That's coming. Okay? Um, you're on an aircraft carrier. Are you going to launch a jet if it has no way to find its way back to your aircraft, or no way to find the target or find its way back to the aircraft carrier? Right? This is here. Okay? So when we talk about electronic warfare, it's not just shutting down the infrastructure the grid, okay? It goes far beyond that. Just even putting out false information. Um, well, I'm just going to keep digressing here. Um, so, you know, we cited, you know, Egypt shutting down the, inter the, the Internet. What started that revolution? Does anybody know what started the, the most recent? <laughs> or what, what fueled it? Let me say that. Twitter? Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, and social to, media. They were able to kind of come together and meet, you know, use that as, as a means of communication to be like, hey, we're going to meet here and rally here or protest here. Right. And the government's like, hey, we need to stop this. Right. They have this protest. And like, it's hit the kill switch. Facebook fueled and even started a revolution. I think it was a video I made it on it. Um, I, I'm not, didn't research it, as I probably should have. Okay. All right, so this actually happened. What if someone were to falsely see that information. Think about that. Okay, this happened because something was up on the Facebook. It's on the internet. It must be true, right? <laughs> um, so, what's to prevent a country from doing this? You know, putting false information up and just fueling a falsely based revolution. Is that kind of China done <coughs> the censorship that they do to their citizens? Could be. Like they, they you know, you certainly like certain video games. If you can't have over there, yep. certain things on the internet they censor, so their citizens historical facts they will not allow people to actually read that. Yeah. Well, during the uh, 
the whole Cuba crisis, the United States actually uh, almost implemented something to where uh, American agents would pose as Cubans mm -hmm. do terrorist activities in America to get us into a war with them. <laughs> well, there, there are other things. We can even look more they recently. never actually um, ended up getting <laughs> implemented, but yeah. yeah. I was like, I can't believe they actually started talking about uh, that. There was, a, <laughs> there was a video out um, on, on, on 911, and yeah. I don't know if you ever saw it, and I still don't know. Um, there are some things that are highly questionable. Well, because after occurred. that whole thing happened, everybody ended up mm -hmm. digging, and then they found Operation York, which is where they talked about the whole Cuban thing. Yep. And they're like, this is very similar. Oh, and in a think tank, um, what was it, Cheney? Several years before, Cheney said in the think tank, in the think tank, to get the American public to move, we need something catastrophic to happen to me. And that, that's that's out oh. there, so you can find no. that information. The U.S. government's actually talked before about sinking a ship with American citizens on it during to ignite a war with Cuba. Yeah. It was a, it was a declassified <laughs> document from like the seventies, like to incite a riot because we can totally digress. Oh yeah, in yeah. fact, I'm, I'm drawing this back here. Here we go. <laughs> Myths about the internet. Okay, the internet is free. Well, we know that. Super free. <laughs> Super free. Um, someone controls the internet. Now, here's the thing, though. Of course, governments can. Um, companies. Network throttling. Mm -hmm. Network neutrality. Does anybody know what network neutrality is? Yeah. It's too bad I actually signed a petition to get into combat. With the general concept, can you describe it? Uh, well, basically, it just means like everything that goes over the internet has the same value. Exactly. exactly. Equivalence. Yeah. Okay. So no information should be discriminated. As you know, Comcast just bought Time Warner. In Canada, Comcast was found guilty of throttling Skype communications. And why, you know, and I can see both sides. Okay, Skype is a service. They're not paying Comcast, probably what they should or if they are at all. And they're just using their network and charging people money to video conference. Well, in Canada, Comcast said, no, this is not going to happen. So they throttled them. What did they do? They lowered the quality of service, QoS. Quality of service, fault tolerance, security, scalability. So people using Skype in Canada would get decreased, diminished communications, and maybe it would drive them to use Comcast's VoIP. Okay? In this country, in the South, Comcast was found guilty of throttling Netflix. Why? Well, Time Warner distributes movies. Comcast does as well. Because now you're, a network, you know, you're watching uh, Netflix and the movie's jittery and poor resolution and start, right, stopping and starting. Maybe it will drive you to buy the movie from Comcast or it's Time so, Warner. It's such a dirty practice. So, so, didn't they win the lawsuit against Netflix yep. just recently where they now they settled. Netflix? They, or, yeah, they, they settled. They were going to charge right. Netflix because they were yep. using up more bandwidth or yep. something. So, but it's, you know, is it Netflix or is it the users? You know? So, uh, anyways, we know that the Internet and the World Wide Web are not identical. Okay. Search sites. And this is, I'm going to do this, I'll cover this really in its entirety tomorrow. I'm going to fly through it today. Because we're going to look at search from both the user's perspective, because most people don't search well. Um, but also from the organization's perspective. And think about this. And I use the example of Hudson Valley, hvcc.edu. Um, how do people find us? Through search. Okay. Someone in Armenia, Mongolia, California, Arkansas, is not typing hvcc.edu into the browser's location. It doesn't happen. Okay. So how do they find us? Through search, which means you better be near the top of the search engine rankings. Um, search is far more um, lucrative, or the return is far better than pay-per-click, something like 8 to 1. And people pay a lot of money for pay-per-click to put those ads out there. Whereas search, of course, and as soon as the, your ad for pay-per-click goes away, or go away your, you know, your marketing, if you do search well, it persists. Okay? Um, so we're going to look at it tomorrow from both the user standpoint, how should we search, how do we search, but also what can organizations do to improve their search. And to improve your search, what you really need to do is you need to understand web design and the Google or, you know, Bing, whatever, crawlers. Now, I also just said a word there. 
Um, and I've used it a bunch, and I probably need to qualify it. Web design. When I say web design, I'm not talking about pretty graphics, anything like that. That failed. Dot com crash. Okay. When I say web design, I am talking about W3C compliant, World Wide Web Consortium compliant, standards-based, accessible web design. So it can be rendered on every platform, on every, in every browser. Okay. Because if, if it can't be rendered properly on a browser, well, whoever uses that browser, I'm not getting their business. Okay, whether it's just even giving them information. So I better be W3C compliant because that's a standard. Okay? If I write and code my web website in accord with W3C standards, 3C standards, even two years from now, a new browser comes out, the browser will be W3C compliant and it will be rendered correctly. Okay? So I have to do this. Now there are other things, and we'll talk about when we get to web design, we talk about inverted pyramid writing style which is really a journalistic um, writing style, you'll hear the term above the fold you know, from old newspapers. You're walking by a newspaper, you want the headline there to catch someone's attention. Same thing with an internet, with, with, excuse me, a web page. When I talk about above the fold, what I'm talking about is what's displayed on the screen. And that's changing. You know, I'm looking at these, this nice big you know, Mac monitor, very different from your mobile phone. So above the fold, we'll look, at, look, about that, look at that. Um, We'll look at wayfinding, okay, and how users navigate through your website. And it should be by recognition rather than recall. Um, so intuitively, when someone comes to your website, they should be able to see what they need and pr proceed. Because again, studies have also shown people will look at a web page, if they don't see what they need, they're gone. And they will never return. And your competitors are a click away, right? It's, it's as quick as back and choose the next one in that search and then your competitor gets that sale. So, so there's that too. Now there are exceptions to that. Amazon.com, okay? Have you, have you ever looked at Amazon.com's web page when you get it up? It's a shocker. There's more information there than I, I don't even look at it, okay? What, what, a lot of people probably don't. You get no. to the point where you're like, I'm not, I but, know what I'm here, I came here for a certain purpose. I'm, here for a I'm gonna, Where's that search bar? Boom, cool. I'm gone. Right, and that's it. They established a different model search within Amazon. Yeah. I feel on Amazon, like I just got done building my own PC. Yep. I use Newegg because their layout is really nice. Yep. Like, kind of like search and browse. Yep. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, I want to find, I want to buy this, and then I copy you know, the <laughs> number, the product description, and then go look at it and see if it's cheaper on Amazon. Yep. Because if you try to like Look through just individual computer parts on Amazon. There's oh, you can't. Eighty million of them. They're like their fields to like narrow everything is horrible. And I mean, it's just. And think think about what you just said. Looking at Newegg for parts, <laughs> search and browse, navigation through recognition. Exactly what Newegg does, and what you have to do because you're competing against Amazon, and you know. But there's like sites like PC Builder. Dot com stuff like that, mm -hmm. which will you'll get the thing, and then they'll give you the price of the cheapest one on right. wherever it goes. But so that's you more. Don't have to do that long way of going. And but but Newegg, I, I wouldn't doubt that Newegg would have better descriptions. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So, again, content provider. And you I, know? I like Newegg too because they have um, a lot of the popular items have uh, like short videos, kind of like unboxings, and mm -hmm. uh, compatibility and stuff like that. Yep. And, and you know, and we'll talk about that too. That's value-added components. When we get to um, information systems, we'll have value-added distributors who just repackage things, but they give you additional value, and it makes sense to purchase from them because there's better support, things like that. So we're we're talking about exactly what we should be talking about. So again, we'll look at this searching keyword search, directory search, all these things tomorrow. Uh, Evaluating search. One one word on citing internet resources. Um, and again, it'll, it'll vary by course now what you're taking, whether they're APA, MLA, Chicago style. Um, just know, well, each faculty is different in how strict or rigid they are. Um, <clears throat> know that Microsoft Word actually has errors in their APA format. Okay? If you look at so if you have a faculty who is strict on APA. 
the latest version, and you just blindly use Microsoft Word to use it, you will have errors. <laughs> so it depends on how strict the faculty is. Pretty much the higher you go, you get into graduate school, especially you know, PhD dissertation, you miss a period at the end of a reference. You know, it's, it's, it's bad. So um, just know that. What's real important, of course, with internet sources is the retrieved and the date. Okay? Because again, the, the internet, World Wide Web, using internet correctly here. Um, but the World Wide Web is a dynamic entity, uh, so things will change. So you need that timestamp to validate that it was, was there at some point in time. Okay. I'm not going to say anything about instant messaging or text messaging. Um, you guys do it better than I. Uh, I actually just got it back. Uh, I've been without text for about four years. Um, I wasn't going to pay the extra five dollars. Um, <laughs> hey, you know. um, Verizon just came out with a new plan: um, forty-five dollars unlimited text and data. No, not data. Excuse me, unlimited text and voice. And 500 megs of data. I don't use much data. So it's $45. And no additional tax on top of that. So, um, so I have text to get. Um, I just can't tell my wife. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, not going to say much about web conferences and webinars. Again, from our perspective as system administrators or analysts, we have to be concerned as soon as we go web conferencing with the quality of service. QoS, okay? We go, you know, it, it's one thing of the CEO saying, okay, I want everyone to do, you know, web conferencing. Well, what that's going to do for your bandwidth requirements, they're going to go through the roof. Do you have the necessary bandwidth to support web conferencing throughout your organization? So you're going to have to look at that. So social networking, we kind of introduced, um, and again, it's, it's, you know, business IT society, right? Social networking. The idiot, um, you know, the revolution. IT, which is Facebook, Twitter, all these things, changed society. They fueled a revolution. You look at, um, you know, when the, the plane went down in the Hudson, and there were something like 10,000 tweets before the news broke on CNN. <laughs> you know, um, it's changed, changing the world. Um, again, it's that, it's that communication. Everybody has a voice. It's good and it's bad, you know, because uh, everybody has a voice. Uh, everybody, wa everybody wants to be heard, you know. Uh, and now we have, of course, the Google Glass, so people get to document their entire day, 365 days a year. Yes. So, so um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, now, one of the things I haven't, and we'll look at, in privacy uh, and security in the upcoming, upcoming weeks is social engineering is probably more important for, you know, for hacking, things of this nature, but also your security than anything. Uh, I can use the example of message boards. Okay, if I want to hack into a site, okay, and message boards, of course, Web 2.0, people asking questions. Um, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to the company, and I'm going to get their directory information, find out who their system administrators are. Because quite likely, everyone has problems, and everybody's more and more using open source software, actually web servers, all kinds of things. And if they have a configuration problem, where do they go for help? The online community. And if they use their real name, searching, Hi, this is so and so, or they don't even have to say who they're from, but their username is there. Um, and they're looking for a patch for an Apache web server running on some platform. Okay, you've now told me what you're using. Okay, so I can now apply known hacks. And I'm going to get into this in more detail when we get to, to security and privacy. But you don't let that out there. Um, in a minute, we'll look at Spyware and Adware, what's going on with social networking. And I'll just give you an example, and this is happening right now. Facebook, by the way, the Facebook API is open. Um, you can mine the data. You can get in, see, you know, look at the social graph. So now, I'll give you an example from a parent's perspective. This is actually happening to some friends. 
Uh, and I have a five-year-old daughter, so she's she's hitting that consumer age. It's a frightening <laughs> thing. And and you know, but but she's not on Facebook now, nor will she ever be on Facebook. So uh, you know, but it's but daddy, daddy, or whatever. I want this. I want this. You know. Okay. So, but yeah, take take this out now to you know an older older age. Um, so if some my daughter is at the dinner table and she's asking me for something, she asks five times. It's probably pretty true that she's spoken to her friends on Facebook on it or Twitter or something. It's probably out there. Okay. So what's happening now is people are mining this Facebook data. So now, give it another week or so, and an email shows up in my inbox. Okay. Thank you for your purchase of. Whatever it was she's talking about. You can track your package here. Okay? If you have any problems, and this is a very professional email, you know, if you have any problems, please do not hesitate. Very nice to contact our customer service. We will make it right for you. And what does the unsuspecting parent, you know, the other 99.9% .9 of the people out there, not me, <laughs> they, they're, they're clicking on that link. Click. And as soon as they do that, they're downloading. Yeah, we're spyware. This is happening with airline tickets. You know, thank you for using your you know frequent flyer miles. You know, we hope you enjoy your stay. As a benefit, we'd like to offer you a free car rental in whatever. I, I'm not. No, I'm not using my. Like I'm not using my frequent flyer miles that way. Right. Great. So, um, and this is this is happening. Now we can defend ourselves because I can look at the source. Um, I actually have some. You know phishing scams, um, and you'll look at the source encoding, and it's, you know, Citizens Bank is what I'm seeing in my email, and you'll, you'll laugh, but looking at the source where it, really, where it wanted to redirect me was someone's phishing and gun chat, you know, obviously probably over in the Soviet Union somewhere or something like this, <laughs> but, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> what about Citizens Blank, where they end up having, like, one letter off? Yep, so, <laughs> so this is happening. So beware of social engineering. Beware of social media. It's out there. It's going to be out there forever. People are, boy, I should just stop here. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll say something. I know. There's more. I'll, I'll go on. So I'll stop right there. Um, online shopping and investing. Now, one of the things um, I didn't talk about, and I'll talk about here in just a minute, and really we need to, need to understand the functionality of what's taking place and, and why our privacy is at risk. Okay. The HTTP, so I'm not really talking about the slide here. Um, <clears throat> the HTTP protocol, hypertext transfer protocol, is a stateless protocol. Okay. Which means that nothing is remembered without other things taking place. So as an example, if I go to ESPN.com, okay, what really happens is I go to ESPN.com and their web server sends me back a static page, an HTML page. And it doesn't have their embedded like links and embedded video, all these things. That doesn't come down right away. Why? Because a web server should never force something on a user. You could be on a cell phone with 250 you know, megabytes of data a month. And if I push video content at you and use up all your data and you get charged for it, you're not coming back to my website. Okay? So we let the user's browser be in charge. Now, of course, I'm looking at a Mac display here on a high-speed network. So I've gone to ESPN.com. It comes back to my browser. And my browser then, of course, knows I, I want to see everything. It goes back to ESPN and asks for all those videos, all those links. But ESPN's server doesn't remember that this is me. It's just getting blindly, oh, you want this video? Here you go. And when it gets back to my browser, my browser reconstructs it into the web page that I see. So it's the stateless nature. But there are times when I need session management. I need to remember. How do, we, how do we remember and track things? Cookies. Okay. So the web server will download a cookie on my computer. And it could contain local information like my cart you know, in Amazon or something. Or it could just be an identifier you know, for Amazon because they, have, they keep track. You can you know, flush your cookies, but as soon as you log back into Amazon, it has what's in your cart. So they're maintaining the cart on the site, on the server, OK? Um, so this is taking place. So cookies, they support, of course, e-commerce. They're necessary. They support Web 2.0 communications, Facebook, OK? So you can keep communicating. Your wall refreshes things of this nature. It can identify you. 
Okay? But, but cookies also have a downside because now they're tracked. And this wasn't always the case. So I'll kind of give you a lead into what's about to take place tomorrow. Um, here's my site, ESPN.com. Um, <coughs> and just, just a word, how much time do I have? Um, note when I did this. Remember, so if I type ESPN.com into my browser location bar, right? Well, first, I need the IP address of what ESPN.com is, right? So I need to go to the domain name server. But let's not, let's not forget I have a three-way handshake just to get that back. Now I get the IP address. And I go to ESPN.com, and I get that static page. It comes back. My browser looks, OK, get me the videos, all this stuff, sends other messages back, separate ones, and they all come back. So next time you load ESPN.com and you see it load pretty much like that, realize that we went three-way handshake, the main name server, three-way handshake to ESPN, static HTML back, handshakes, videos. All this in literally the blink of an eye. OK. What I'm going to introduce and show you more tomorrow, but ESPN did set some cookies. Um, I use Chrome, and I'll take you through my settings probably tomorrow. I'll show you that tomorrow. Um, but let me just show you my collusion graph. Okay, so this is a plugin, Chrome plugin. So, and I've been to two sites, I think. And so ESPN set a cookie, and this is who they're shared with. So if I go to any other site, so, and you'll see here somewhere is Amazon.com, okay? Okay. This is collusion. I saw this on uh, 60, like, like at the gym they were doing, they showed this really? exact thing. So on how, like, uh, how like different websites track your yes. information and yep. like, how they get it and yep. stuff. It was and these, fun. these ones with the red, I'm, I'm blocking, so I'm not sharing that information. And I'll show you some plugins that will prevent your cookies from being shared. But take a look at this, okay? Because I went to ESPN, and of course it shares with somewhere here is Amazon. So what actually happens now is I go to ESPN, I get an ESPN cookie. I go to Amazon. Amazon gets all my cookies. They see one from ESPN. They now know, hey, you like sports. So I'm going to throw, yeah. That's, we start, isn't that how advertising works on Facebook, where they, they can scan your, your information and mm -hmm. say you like puppies? They can give you ads for you can buy a puppy here. Yep. Well, and they're adding this information at the server to your social graph. And here, here goes another digression. <laughs> um, but there's, there's a lot of value. There's a lot of power here. Okay? I'm going to contrast, because Facebook now has search. Okay? Search for products, things of this nature, based on their social graph. Let's look at the difference between Google search and Facebook search. Okay. I go to, I'm visiting Detroit, and I want a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> and I Google Mexican restaurant. Well, Google sees I'm in Detroit, whatever, and gives me some tailored results. But these are results coming from everyone. Okay? My taste in Mexican food couldn't be more different than my mom's. Okay? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But but I probably share ta taste in Mexican food like you know with my friends. Facebook social graph. I don't use Facebook, but um, so now if I go to Detroit and I were to search. Facebook's for a Mexican restaurant. Well, Facebook has the data of my profile, of who I am, who my friends are, what my demographic is. So they're, they're going to feed me a Mexican restaurant based on people it thinks are in my kind of peer group. So they're kind of ex probably exclude, you know, my elderly or 70-year-old mom, right? So it's probably going to be more in line with what I want. So you can see that Facebook actually has the power to provide better search results, which is scary. We'll look at that later. Because right now, you know, it's like movies. They're doing, they're much better than Google in terms of recommending movies for you, restaurants, things like this. But soon it will be institutions. And it will become part of your search engine ranking. And search now is personalized. We'll look at that tomorrow. Google is actually personalized. So if two people sitting next to each other were to search the same terms, you're going to get different results based on your AdSense profile. We'll look at that tomorrow. If you get a chance before tomorrow, Google like you know, um, Google AdSense or Ad Preferences. Google Ad Preferences and see what they have for your profile, and you will probably be shocked at how 
closely it matches they can describe. It. So that's Google AdWords. OK, so let's see if I can get back on track here. Um, I wouldn't say anything about online auctions, online banking, investing, online music. You know, we could talk probably for hours on BitTorrents and things like that. You know, digital rights management comes into these things. And there are sites out there. There are other sites, too. You know, we look at um, some of these online radio stations that are free. Um, anybody know about archive.org? Archive.org. It's a lot of, some bands will just put their music out there. Um, and there, take a look at it. I mean, OAR, a lot of good stuff, live concerts for free. And the bands are actually just fed, sent feeding them their live tapes. So take a look. It's, it's huge. Um, I haven't been on recently. There are other sites um, in Europe, you know, so Soviet nations. Um, and they look like legitimate sites. And, and we'll take a look at that when we get to privacy and digital rights management. Um, you can get good deals, though. Um, portal pages, again, there's some where you sign in. Others are just tailored to you. And again, it's when we start talking about this, Blackboard. Okay? You cannot use Blackboard if you do not enable cookies. Right? Session management. It's the way that we manage. All, all companies manage that um, session management. OK, I won't say much about online education, distance learning, blogs, wikis, portfolios. Nice to just fly over some of this stuff. Um, censorship, again, I, we discussed this. It's happening. It, it's not hard to do. Of course, governments can just shut down or mislead. You know, you could, you could feed people information. Um, and, yeah, and, yep. But, but you can leak stories. You can leak stories out of context, you know? Um, several years ago, the Bush administration um, subpoenaed all, of, all the search engines for their information. Okay? Um, interestingly, Google said no. Hotmail, or no, yeah, excuse me, Microsoft, Yahoo, <coughs> and some others just said, here you go. Here you go, have it. And Google said no. And really interestingly, Time Magazine, two weeks later, had on the cover with the caption, Google, can we trust them with our data? And I, I was appalled at this misrepresentation. Google was the only search engine that said no. And about page three of the article, it did admit this. But you have to question, just so misleading. Um, think about that power of information. And this was happening right around election time. So very easily you get search engine records, especially if you're a government, you know, opposition. I mean, we're not talking this country, but anywhere. And what if they leak, say, three days before, you know, a election, so and so congressman was searching for child pornography. Out of context, maybe they were working on a bill, right? But all all the paper would have to come out and say, search, right? Essentially that candidate would lose. Having that information, that search engine information. And this, you know, again, with the Bush administration, who knows? Or any administration, you know, there's power there. So um, we're entering a really interesting time. Internet filtering, um, this will, you will have to make a choice at some point, I don't doubt, okay? One is a parent in your house. Um, but if I were a CEO, a CIO, something out in industry, if it was, if it was my job, and I was in an organization, Enterprise, whatever, yeah, I would turn off eBay. I would turn off Facebook. I would turn off Amazon. You know, I would turn all these things off. Especially, you know, what is it, Cyber Monday? Okay? Because nobody's doing work. They're just <laughs> online buying things using. It's like the military network. Yeah. You can't go to so many things, and then you get flagged, and mm -hmm. keywords are flagged, and whatever. And that brings up ransomware. Ransomware um, <coughs> is the recent. Emergent event, um, of course, because and again, again, ten years ago, nobody was just <coughs> collecting cookies and analyzing. Them. Now we're using it for tracking things of this nature. Um, there are sites out there that will collect your cookies and determine if you've been someplace where you shouldn't have been, <laughs> and they will blackmail you. They will threaten to contact your wife, husband, whatever, your employer. You know, on a company machine, you were here. Um, 
So ransomware is out there. And there are, you know, many uses for this. I mean, you can use Tor routing, things like that. You can use all kinds of redirection if you really don't want to be tracked. Um, it's a, to some extent, it's built into Google. Um, I forget what they call. I have to go to my settings um, and check it out. But we'll, we'll take a look at that tomorrow. Um, so again, cookies, very important because they provide for session management. We couldn't do a lot of things without them. You know, shopping carts, all of these things, e-commerce, um, social networking. And, and again, as soon as I talk about Web 2.0, what's required is that three-tier architecture. The database core, middle-tier business logic, and then a web server. OK, so spyware, adware, you know, we're going to talk about this at length. We actually have two different chapters on security, information security, and then network security. So just read what is in the textbook here. Um, one of the things that I don't think I've presented yet um, is clear GIFs. All right, GIF is a graphical interchange format. Okay? It's a picture. Um, we know that we can have an image map to where different portions of a image can link to a URL, okay, to a website. And recall what happens when the HTTP pro protocol. I get the static web page, but then I download all the other elements. A clear GIF. It is possible to have a one pixel portion of that image that is what we call a clear GIF because you can't see it. The human eye cannot pick it up. And that one pixel will link to a website. And that website, if, you, if you're going, if you're going to make a clear GIF, probably not a good website, will link to AdWare, Spyware, whatever. So if you download that image, you're downloading other things with it. Even though you don't see it, along with that clear GIF comes AdWare, Spyware. So just be aware that clear GIFs are out there. And we have the tools, if you really suspect something, to, to at least identify and forward it. Um, you can view source. Take a look at that HTML, okay? And see if, see what the image map maps to, what the links are. So, now, increasingly, um, the search engines are looking at this, okay? They see where the links go to, and then they do try to assess what is linked to. So, less and less. This was a really big security threat, you know, in the early 2000s. Hey, I made it. I made it with a minute to spare. Look at that. Um, so that's it. Tomorrow I'm going to be covering search and search engine optimization. We're going to look at, really, we're going to really go into ad tracking, um, a lot of security things, and really understanding how Google does their page rank, things like that, because this has a, a big bearing on e-commerce. That's it. See you tomorrow.